Spanish government is made up of four key institutions, all of whom are involved in some way or another in making law. Now those institutions are the sovereign, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. Britain is what we define as a constitutional monarchy. It is a constitutional monarchy with a parliamentary form of government, also known as the Westminster system. Each branch serves a different purpose, holds a different role. The sovereign is the source of all power, legislative, executive, and judicial power. The sovereign's role is mostly ceremonial. Now, even though the sovereign's role is mostly ceremonial, we have seen quite recently in the media that members of the royal family have been very active, certain members have been very active in trying to shift legislation, shift government policy in one direction or another. And we also know that they derive many political, economic, social benefits from being the sovereign. So the sovereign does play a part, but when we diagram an image of the institutions, what we usually do is place the sovereign at the very top and then build underneath a triangle to identify the tripartite relationship between the three core branches of government. The executive branch of government holds a number of functions that are performed by the Prime Minister and by the Cabinet. They are responsible, and you can see this from the title itself, the executive branch, they are responsible for executing the laws. By execution we mean implementation, application. They're executing the laws. They're not making the laws. That is the role of the legislative. So the legislative branch of government makes the laws. What is the legislative branch? The legislative branch is parliament, members of parliament, a series of representatives, individuals who are meant to represent the public. Parliament makes the laws, but what parliament also does is provide a forum for political debate. Key concept, public. It's meant to be open. Within a democracy, the thing we're very concerned of is private debate. If the debates are taking place in secret, if the laws are being passed in secret, well, the public can't really know which laws to abide by, but then also how do we know who to hold to account if those laws result in the violations of other laws? The parliament, yes, it does pass laws, but the primary purpose is to provide a forum for public debate so as to produce the laws that regulate our interactions. But then we know there are necessarily going to be disputes over these laws, and this is where the judiciary enters the picture. The judiciary interprets the laws, and they interpret those laws purely and exclusively when there's a dispute that arises around them or someone alleges a violation. I mean that the judiciary does not, of its own volition, decide that it is going to question the constitutionality, the legitimacy of a law. It must wait until a claim is brought before it, at which point it does have jurisdiction over the law in question. Now these branches of government began to differentiate as far back as the 12th century. Separation, the differentiation, the separation. But the differentiation that we see between the branches of government is intended to achieve a balance of power. So it's not differentiation for its own sake, but it's differentiation for purposes of creating a balance of power between the different institutions. What we are trying to avoid, what we are trying to prevent effectively, is the concentration, is too much concentration of power and the danger that comes along with that. There can be no public liberty when the right and the power of making and enforcing the law vests within a sole individual. When we say we have these different branches, 
Each one is apportioned a particular authority, a particular power, a particular duty or responsibility. So the executive will implement the laws. But the executive isn't implementing laws of their choosing. They're implementing laws that are passed along to them by the legislative. Imagine the situation where you're both the executor and the maker of the law. So we can see how that in itself can lead to a bit of conflict, can lead or creates the, opens the door for some type of corruption. But then there's a third branch that engages in the interpretation of those laws. So a law is passed, a law is made, the executive creates the body that goes about enforcing it, and then when there's a dispute that arises around that law, well, the matter then goes to a third branch of government, the judiciary. We have this differentiation, we have this separation, because you can see a situation, dictatorial situation, in which the same individual or the same body of individuals has the capacity to make, enforce, and interpret the law. That opens the door to all kinds of abuse. Now, one thing that we need to be clear about, though, is that we do not have complete differentiation or complete separation of powers. First off, Parliament appoints the executive. So the Prime Minister, members of Cabinet, are also members of Parliament. The executive is made up, usually entirely, by members of the ruling party. Not members of the opposition, unless there is a coalition. But if there is no coalition, then you simply have all members of the executive being members of the ruling party within Parliament. The executive appoints the judiciary. So if we're looking in that diagram that we had before, where we said the legislative sits on top, and then we have a separation where over here we have the executive, and over here we have the judiciary, and we try to present those as being side by side. Each one has a role, we differentiate, we separate them apart. And then when we try to imagine a triangular relationship, we assume then that the legislative is the one who's sitting on top. Because the legislative is the only one out of the three that has the capacity that is empowered to make laws. But then we find out that the legislative appoints the executive the executive is involved in executing the law and also in appointing members of the judiciary. So then all of a sudden the triangle flips and it's almost as though we have the executive and the legislative and then at the bottom the judiciary. Since the judiciary is the one who wields the least power. But then you could also turn it over and place the executive at the top since it is the ruling party within the legislative that appoints the executive and because of party discipline, the majority party will always do what the executive says. So in that case, it seems that the executive is the one that has the most power, followed by the legislative, followed by the judiciary. Now that's a socio-legal way of understanding it, a critical way of understanding it. But if we're just looking at the constitutional separation, the constitutional differentiation, what we have are three bodies, each that is meant to be contained with its own separate role. What you should take away from that is that the absence of complete differentiation, the absence of complete separation when combined with party discipline simply means that the Prime Minister, even with, within a parliamentary system, wields a significant amount of power.